The first picture is a picture is very interesting because if you're looking for the blue line, the blue line is the forecast the global GDP level we did in 2007. The red line is the forecast we did in 2008. So after financial crisis, we thought the global GDP would dip, would gradually go up like that, a little gap. This is for advanced economy, this is for the whole world. But this is the real global GDP level. You see, the global GDP level today is a big drop and remain under the trend and go all the way forward. This is a big, big gap. We lost all those global GDPs in the past seven and eight years permanently. I think this is very important to understand. This crisis leaves a much deeper, much bigger scar than everyone ever thought. This is for the whole world, even for emerging market, you will see they still pick it up, but still there's a gap. And in the advanced economy, the real concern is not only gap, it's keep big, and keep wider. That's mean the growth still becomes slower. This is the real concern of a global GDP. And we permanently, let me emphasize again, lost such a big chunk of real global GDP forever. So we are operating the whole global economy in a lower level. I think that's the first very important concept. Because of that, all the country today is to run under the potential output. So they have an output gap. But you see, all the advanced economy under the, their potential roughly one and a half percent. Japan, Belgium, even U, US is still a little bit behind. Even in the advanced economy, China is still one percentage point under the potential. So the whole world run under this potential. The output gap is still quite a bit. Why that? Why we have such a low potential growth? The few things are quite interesting. Number one, the investments is lower. You will see in the United States, the investments is shared to GDP compared with roughly, this is 14, this is 2007. You will see the US investments share in GDP roughly 200 percentage point lower, investments are lower. In the Europe, the investments are much lower. Investments are only higher in China and in uh, Brazil, in the Russian, but in China, you know, the investments are way too high, need to further adjust. Not only investment, the trade growth is much slower. This is the trade growth, this is GDP, global GDP growth rate. Trade growth is always stronger than global growth rates, right? This is 8089. In 90, particularly, trade growth is two times more. And in the year 2000, thing was trade growth is much stronger. The first time, first time, the trade growth is slower than global GDP growth. In the past 30 years, we never ever observed that since it happened. The global trade growth is slower than global GDP growth. More than that, the really the issues confuse everyone. We're still looking for the reason. It's a global FDR is much lower. You will see the FDR 2000, 2007, and the 13. We see the global capture flow. But what surprised us is the real FDR in terms of share of a global GDP is all global. Global FDR in terms of share of a global GDP is a lower period by period so today. Roughly, global FDI in terms of share of GDP is 37% lower than year 2000. We lost 40% of FDI globally, which is a big impact for the global GDP and the global capital. Meanwhile, we see the huge global financial flow, right? The real capital flow actually slows dramatically. We're still looking for the reason. We still don't know why the real capital flow will, will drop in such a big way. If we're putting, putting those together, you have a weak on the, the investments, you have a weak trade, and you have a weak on the FDI. Obviously, growth will be weak, more than that. The real issue is we try to figure out what will be the potential growth for the next five years. You know, when we talk about the potential growth, it's basically we talk about potential capital growth rates, 
we talk potential labor growth rates, we talk potential productivity growth rates. So this is the composition for the key issues. Since the year 2000, the potential growth is pretty high in advanced economy, is in the emerging market. U.S. did quite a bit during the crisis period, understand. But overall, in the next five years, we forecast the potential growth rates still much lower than the year 2000 to 2007. A little bit of up from the, the advanced economy, in emerging market, will continue low. The potential growth is a concept to measure the capacity, to measure the how much the system can grow. So this is a very important concept. This is the base for the growth. Why that? We see the cap potential capital growth is weakening, which we show investments is lower. We see the labor surprise is weakening dramatically in the advanced economy because demographic change, because aging. And the particular key issue is the productivity growth today. Overall, all the world is weakening. The productivity growth is lower everywhere. In the advanced economy, in US, in Europe, in UK, in emerging market, in China, in Brazil, in Russia, everywhere. So the key issue is to how can we promote the productivity growth? And you will see the productivity growth and is lower. But still, if you're looking for the next five years, the potential growth is still heavily depends on the productivity growth. That's the real challenge for the next five years. The productivity growth has been slower. But for the next five years, the growth is still pending on the productivity growth. So the key challenge for the whole world is really how to boost this part of the growth, which is productivity growth, has become very important uh, issue. And uh, for the emerging market, there's a lot of people talk about that. We don't revised the potential growth since the year 2000s. For the advanced economies, given the, the potential growth, we see we dropped them roughly half percentage point and compare with before the 2010. And also emerging market, the potential growth lost 1.5%. This is a quite a big potential growth loss compared with the previous ones here, compared with this one, you will see, and the further, and uh, this is emerging market except China. So China played quite a big chunk in terms of the potential growth. The potential growth loss is a big issue. Because emerging market lost quite a big potential growth rates, so this is the catch up. This is the emerging market growth rates minor the advanced economy growth rates. So how much emerging market growth is stronger than the advanced economy. You will see this is roughly from 70 to year 2000, roughly around one and a half to two, really peaked during the crisis time, emerging market growth picked up, now dropped down. So we expect to see the emerging market catch up pass will slower go back to uh, normal situations. Why emerging market slow down? The reason is very simple, because in the past 10 years, oil prices are way high, now it's much lower. In the past few years, commodity prices way high, it's much lower. The food prices way high. So the commodity cycle is over. And the, you will see the trade value is much lower today. It's also from a uh, advanced economy, from the emerging market as well. And also, you see the interest rates lower very much uh, during the crisis times and now it's going to pick them up. So external environments is really changing for the emerging market because the super commodity cycle is over, because uh, trade change is weaker, and the easy financing, low interest rate environments is almost over because Fed is going to raise interest rates. So those are quite a big change, has quite a big impact on the, the, the emerging market impacts. And also, advanced economy, weak growth has a big impact on the emerging market. But the emerging market also will have a negative impact on the advanced economy as well. We have to keep that in mind. You will see if emerging market lower 1% of global GDP will impact roughly 10 base points for US, quite a big 0.3% and roughly half percentage GDP growth negative impact on Japan as well. So we are really live together now. So the whole world is linked together. The global emerging market slowdown will have quite a big impact on the global GDP growth as well. China, 
Everybody concerns about China growth or slowdown, but the key issue will interest how much China growth slowdown will impact for the whole world. We have a very interesting study where we say 1% of Chinese investment slowdown, let me emphasize investment slowdown, it's not the GDP, will impact China trade partners GDP growth slowdown. So roughly we'll have for Philippines, for Thailand, roughly 3.3, 3.4, Korea roughly have a 1% investment slowdown have a 0.6% negative GDP growth impact on South Korea. This is huge. And on China's, this is manufacturing partner, commodity partners, you will see on Chile, on Zimbabwe, on Saudi, on uh, Kazakhstan, roughly 1% of Chinese investment drop will have 0.3 to 0.4 potential GDP growth. Now, Think about that. This is not the two same thing. This is China's investments job has a negative impact on China trade partners' GDP growth job. And China, we see need to drop 10 percentage point of investment from kind of 44 percent of the GDP to roughly 35, 34. So 10 percent of investment job, how much will impact on the negative GDP growth on the China trade partners? which will be huge. And the second, think about that. The China need to adjust its macroeconomic structure not only for today, for the next five years, maybe 10 years. So China's impact on its demand on the global commodity manufacturing trade partner is a long-term issue. So we we'll have to understand that long-term impact from China to the whole world as well. So the commodity price, because of that, commodity price also the other reason probably oil price really drop and understand that. We see the oil price will stay lower. Why that? This is the cost function of the oil production. It's not a fiscal cost. It's the cost, production cost. You see on the Middle East, the onshore, the per barrel cost is only $29. Offshore share, share of is only 43 and uh, extra heavy oil is really 53 deep water. So roughly shale gas is today is around $40, $45 per barrel. So the cost is really low. The real high-end cost come to the oil sand from the really deep waters. They do have a high uh, cost of that. But over a big chunk of the oil production still remain under production cost around $40 per barrel. So that's the reason when the monopoly can be broken down, everybody tries to maintain their output. Since oil price drop, Saudi still produce 10.2 million barrel uh, oil per day. US still produce 12.4 million barrel oil today. Doesn't change it at all. With Iran, with Iraq joining the supply side, so we'll see the oil price will be low for quite a while, which is good news, but also will create a different and the impact for the different country depends on your import and output as well. When we, from the real economy, move to the financial sectors, what we thought is really the central bank's balance is expanded dramatically, particularly in Japan, in all the advanced econo e economies, roughly from 5%, 10% of GDP increase to 15% as well. The key figure is here. It's here. The government death level is really way, way high. You will see this is a, the whole advanced economy, the death level. This death level is way higher than the World War, the government death level. It's almost close to World War II. It's hard to believe, see how high the government deaths they have today. It's for the world average, even for the emerging market, death level is way, way high. The death level higher has quite a few impacts here. Because the one key issue is when you have a high death, you have to pay high interest rates. It's hard to read this number, I understand. Let me just point one line. In the advanced economy, in 2007, the total government death is 71.6% of GDP. Today, it's roughly 104.6. So death increase roughly 40%. How much debt interest rates they pay? 2.9% of GDP at that time, 2.9% GDP today. So that's increase of 40%, but the interest payments remain very low. Why is that? 
because uh, the interest rates are so low, which have a profound impact on the low interest rates as well. So we need to keep that in mind as mine. Interest is low, everybody understand here. Yeah, oh, I can jump a little here. <laughs> so everyone say interest low is QE, which is true, but it's not a QE. You see the interest rates really peaked the US interest rate roughly in 80s and all the way down, 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 all the way to today. And the short term and the real interest rates is negative. When, but also tricky thing is when interest rates drop quite a bit is the interest rates drop, but the capital cost doesn't drop at all because very important on the capital market. Now the question is here, will the interest rates go back and will interest rates go stay low? This is a fundamental issue because lower interest rates change the production behavior, change the consumer behavior. This is a very in important index for the whole world and we expect to see interest rates stay low level because the debt pressure here. It cannot afford a high interest rate. So whole things really link to each other now. So when, if we move to financial market, if we putting them together, it's really the story I try to say is, yes, we lost a big chunk of global GDP. Yes, because crisis, the potential growth is much lower. Yes, because potential growth is lower, we operate under the output gap. So we need aggregate policy. We need a demand policy to push the demand, to push the growth, right? It's very straightforward, that's econ 101. But unfortunately, what I tried to tell you in the second part is, there's no macro policy space. There's no monetary space. Central bank's balance sheets is expanded big enough already. There's no fiscal space because they cannot borrow more money. Because even in the today's level, if interest rates increase, every government will be in big problem because they squash their fiscal space. 1% interest increase, 1% physical space shrink. So no physical space. More than that, we're also facing the financial market change. The big financial market changes, really strict changes, the whole banking intermediations shift away from banking sector to schedule banking, to asset management company. You will see asset management company really grow up strongly, it's the whole thing compared with roughly pension funds, you know, I mean, you will see this is really strong growth, and you will see the copper bonds overseas is very much owned by the pension fund now. The pension fund today becomes the big financing institutes. Let me give you one number. In the United States, compared today with 2007, the whole banking sector lent to the private sector, the real sector, dropped $286 billion. But the money comes from asset management company. The lending from asset management company to the real sector increase 1.36 trillion. The whole financial intermediation shift away from traditional banking sector to the non-banking sector, which has a profound impact on what? On particular on market liquidity issues. So when the central bank liquidity increases because of low interest rates, the market liquidity becomes very, very tight. And this is a typical chart to say how tight is the market liquidity. You will see the blue bar, it is the dealer's infantry holding for the bonds. They need to clean the market. You see the peak is 400 billion in 2008. Today, it's roughly only 100 billion. This is the, the, the index. So the dealer's infantry is only 25% of the peak level in the crisis. But the bond size needed to be cleaned, increased roughly from 20 trillion to 40 trillion. So why market liquidity is so tight? I call the liquidity illusion issue. The bonds side increased what, two times, roughly for 40 trillion. The infantry, the bonds the dealer hold, so they can clean the market drop, roughly only has 25% of peak level. This gap is a real market liquidity gap. So I always say, this chart is a real liquidity illusion. The central bank liquidity and the market liquidity. And the shift really caused a big concern on those issues. 
And uh, another concern is the dollar has become stronger. I, I'm putting two things together. It's not necessarily have to go together, but it's interesting. The red bar means the number of crosses. You will see when dollar becomes stronger, and in 80, you have a lot of crosses here. In later 90s, when dollar goes stronger again, crosses again. Why that? When dollar goes stronger, dollar goes back to US, the cost of emerging market, the capital issues, and when dollar getting stronger, the corporate sector's balance sheets and the country's balance sheets become worse. They have to pay more. So dollar strong always associate on the balance sheet management as well. And the Fed raised interest rates also a concern. You know, everybody talk about Fed. Fed is, is racist. So Fed, I think, did a good job in terms of communication, make it very clear to every, everybody what is the policy. But real concern is in the market. The real concerns are here. This is a fair the forecast interest rates. This is a market forecast expected interest rates. This is the risk premium because low interest rates, the risk premium is so low and almost and the negative, and the average risk premium should 175 base point, 1.75 percent as well. Now the problem is if the fair the risk rates, whether this curve will move to this curve. How soon, how fast? If this curve move to that curve, that will cause the global repricing for all different uh, uh, risk of the assets. That will cause the market volatility. So Fed raise interest rates, I'm not concerned the capital flow today. The really concern is the whole market response to that, whole market expectation move into the Fed uh, forecasting deadline. I think this move, how soon, how fast, this is a big uncertainty here in the market, given the market liquidity is very tight. And the loss of this chart is also very scary. This is very technical. So the real another concern today is, is really NC, but it's a serious in financial market interconnectivities. This bar showed how much interconnectivity increase. This is the US Treasury, UK. The global US Treasury interest moved roughly from 40% cold movement to 80% cold movement. Emerging market, you see uh, the index move also from roughly 45% to 75%. So you, you will see that this is US high yield bonds market cold movements. Cold movements increase really dramatically during the crisis. We are living in such a tight and interconnected world, which is bad news for portfolio management because I mean, you invest in whatever the market, it doesn't matter because every market moving the same thing, right? But it created a big problem for us. The real concern is when the market moves into the one direction, it soaks all the liquidity. It makes liquidity extremely, extremely tight. So you will see is the blue dose is the, the, the co movements. The co movements levels vary from 20% 20 to 0 0.8, and it roughly varies. So this is liquidity become very tight, and this is okay. So liquidity is pretty much okay. But the red dose is after crisis. What happened compared before crisis and after crisis, connectivity increased, the co movements increased dramatically. You will see most heavy parties here. At that time, most heavy parties are here now, and move all the way to the liquidity tightening. It's even more in the derivative market. In the derivative market, you will see the co-movements and the liquidity is always moving sort of in a very different distribution map. But after the crisis, they all highly interconnected and with a very tight liquidity. The reason is very simple. If everyone into the one direction, drop the money into the one direction, of course, there's no market. That's a real concern. If the curve move towards this line, we don't know how far, how soon, how big, how strong. We know if they move into that direction in a strong way, the market will shift all the way to this end. We're facing a real, real serious liquidity challenge. So this is the things we experienced just a week ago when China's stock market changed Volatize the global market volatile dramatically. You will see fix roughly 
from 15% uh, jumped to more than 40% just over a day and two days. The market can change very dramatically because we're living in a such, such interconnected world. Putting them together, I think the, the, the message is very clear. Number one, we lost a lot of global GDP because of crisis. The scarf is deep, deeper and bigger, and we all run under the potential growth, and the future potential growth also is weakening because the weak investments growth, the weak labor supply growth, and also the weak productivity growth as well. And when we're facing the weak, the growth, we need the aggregate demand policy to push the growth. We don't have a policy space because we don't have monetary policy, we don't have a fiscal policy. So, but financial sectors, we're also facing challenges uh, because the shifting in the market structures and because the strong dollar and the federal risk interest rates and the possible market volatility as well. So what's the policy recommendation? The policy recommendation goes very straightforward. Number one, at this time, maintain the macro stability still the key. The global cooperation become extremely, extremely important today because we all live together. And the most important today, given we don't have a demand side policy space, do the supply side things, do the structural reform. These are the key issues and the structural reform in the product market, in the labor markets, in the service sectors, in pension reforms, all those structural reforms will play an important role to boost the potential growth for the futures, invest in the infrastructure, in the knowledge economies, the long-term R&D, innovation of SMEs. The structural reform is everything. We found the whole world need to do the structural reform. It's a low-income country, it's an emerging market, it's an advanced economy with different roles in the different areas. But for the next few years, we'll say structural reform is the key thing to define the growth potential, to define the growth of the whole world. I will stop here. Thank you very much.